All right, I think it's that time. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Way Back Wednesday. This is episode two, covering Age of Conan. And uh, please announce that tonight we have with us a very special guest, Mr. Craig Morrison of Funcom. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Uh, real quick, would you like to introduce yourself and uh, let everybody know who you are and what yep, it is my, you do? My name is uh, Craig Morrison, and I'm the game director and executive producer on Age of Conan Unchained. All right, so tonight we're playing Age of Conan Unchained. I was actually a pre-purchase person. I uh, bought Age of Conan, played it for a few months, and kind of put it on the shelf and followed it, but never really picked it back up and played it again. And uh, <clears throat> with the uh, conversion to uh, free-to-play with Unchained, what kind of activity have you guys really seen with your player base? Yeah, I mean, it was a tremendous success last summer when we launched uh, the Unchained version. You know, I think the market is uh, embracing the free-to-play model, uh, and it kind of it, it reduces the barriers for entry for players. They can, you know, both we saw a lot of players come back who hadn't played the game in a while. Uh, we saw new players coming in who, you know, would previously have uh, previously would have uh, been maybe put off by the uh, by the subscription that came and tried the game. Uh, so it's kind of great for uh, energizing uh, the games, and you know you're seeing a lot of the uh, older games that used to only have subscriptions move to the free-to-play model uh, because it offers uh, the benefits to uh, both to us as developers and to the community. You know, more people get to try the game. You know, and Age of Conan will be four years old this year, so it's it's great for us to be able to re-energize the brand and have players come back and try out the game for themselves. And, you know, I think even with a, a four-year-old game, Age of Conan is, is one of the best-looking and most unique games out there on the market. Uh, so it's really great for us to be able to get people coming back and giving the game a second chance. And that's what we try to do here is highlight, you know, older games that may have been just people haven't played for a while, but they're still out there doing well and trying to spotlight attention back onto them. Uh, for the people in the chat room and on the stream watching, I'm in Katai. This is one of the newer areas that, have, I guess, have been added within the last 12 months, you said? And uh, Katai, the, the Rise of the Godslayer expansion, that was in 2010. Okay. And then in 2011, we did uh, the Savage Coast of Tehran, which was an adventure pack add-on, uh, which added this. So the area in now is Gateway to Katai, and that kind of uh, is one of those areas that we added that allows players to, after they finish the starting area in Tortage, this is one of the areas they can go to. Uh, and it kind of gives players an introduction to the to the region of Kitai, which is kind of uh, Howard, Robert E. Howard, the original Conan author. It's his version of uh, the Far East of China and Korea. Uh, so we very much kind of took the Asian influence for uh, the Rise of the God Slayer expansion. And uh, so this is the uh, the plains leading to Kitai. Uh, so you can see the, the Great Wall uh, kind of dominates this play field. Uh, one, you, know, you can kind of see it from quite a f ways away in almost every direction when you first come to the play field that you've got this uh, you know, huge kind of monolithic construction that, that kind of borders, uh, just like the Great Wall of China did in real life. Uh, Kitai has its own uh, Great Wall, and this is kind of a starter zone that gives the players the, uh, the feeling for Kitai, because they'll, they'll come back there later uh, at maximum level. A lot of the uh, post-level 80 progression, the alternate advancement progression, and the raid progression, dungeon progression, uh, comes in Kitai. So, th so those play fields really add a lot of content for max level players, which is one of those things you know, that players maybe thought was lacking when the game first launched. So with each of the expansions and adventure pack add-ons, we try and address you know, those points that are, of what players uh, want to see added to the game, because that's kind of the beauty of uh, getting to work on MMOs is that you constantly get to add and tweak and add new content and address the things that, uh, that players want you to, uh, to look at. Yeah, that's one of the reasons that I'm drawn to MMOs as well, is the fact that they're, they're a living environment that's constantly growing, as opposed to a static world or a one-player game, you basically buy it and you play it, and maybe they'll have some DLC, maybe they won't, and you're pretty well done. But for those of you that are wondering what Craig was talking about, you can look here on the map and see on the far uh, eastern side there's a giant outline here of a wall. And I actually kind of moved away from it. It's a little bit to the south where I'm at now. But you can also see on some of these hills, uh, maybe not from where I'm standing right now, oh, there you go, into the far distance, there's some eastern oriental style architecture with these little villages that are going on here. It's pretty nice. And I will say that 
for being a four-year-old game, especially when it comes to the environments, it's done very well to, to stand on its own merits and hold up for itself as far as how the actual world of the game looks. I really like it. Yeah, I'm incredibly proud of the art team. I mean, uh, even I, you know, our, the engine team keep developing the visuals, the art team keep being able to add you know, these tremendous areas, you know, we have an engine that's capable of fantastic view distances and uh, able to show these great vistas, you know, you can look out, you can see way off into the distance. And I think it's a good example in this play field that you're in now that, you know, one of the complaints that players had about the game when it first launched was that some of the play fields were a bit linear mm -hmm. and they, they were felt very narrow and guided. So with Kitai and Rise of the Godslayer, we very much opened them out. And these are, uh, you know, you've been playing here for a while before we started. I'm sure you can testify, you know, these, these yeah, I, are big and open. I was going to bring up the fact that I've probably spent the last three hours playing the game Lost, for the most part, <laughs> running around. Like, ah, I just wandered off the trail, where am I going? So if you, if you see me pulling up the mini-map quite a bit, it's because I really just, you know, it's... I Actually, I kind of like it, because if you were in a world that was the way this is, you wouldn't just have beaten paths everywhere. So it kind of adds to the immersion factor that you don't have a road going everywhere you want to go. And while there may seem like there's a small game trail or something, it's just that. It's a game trail. If you get off it, you're going to get turned around and... You're going to have to find your way back. Yeah, and we very much tried to go for that kind of feeling of exploration with the areas in Katai uh, because that was something, you know, that some of the players felt was lacking in the original zones. So, and like I said, you know, the beauty with the MMO is you get to go back and, uh, you know, add that variety and create some areas that uh, are more open for exploration and for players to, uh, you know, to explore and poke around in and uh, try and figure out uh, these larger uh, game areas. Okay, for those of you that are actually kind of wondering what the heck is he doing, I do have a purpose with this meandering that I'm doing. If you look here, there's a little green unlocked. It's called the Breach. This is one of the newer instance types that were added into the game I, you know, when it went unchained, and these are scalable dungeons that you know, they scale to your character level, so you constantly have a challenge. Uh, is there anything you want to add to that? Yep, uh, they're, they're really kind of... They're, they're, they're kind of cool additions that we made uh, last year, and uh, what they are is, like you said, they scale through your level, and they kind of they're they're much more story centric, uh, so that uh, you can kind of uh, get a the kind of the cool experience and a story told, and you know some of them are solo instances and some of them are team instances, so that you have to uh, you know you have to have a team for some of them, and. Uh, they allow the player to, uh, they're daily, so they reset every day, so the player can come back and uh, the player can come back and try again. And they kind of add that kind of story-centric feel uh, to those areas because that's the, uh, one of the appeals of that kind of the early experience stage of Conan and Tortage and have it kind of be dynamic and interesting uh, for the player. And uh, they were really well received. There's a few of them. There's the Forgotten King, uh, Forgotten City, uh, and the Breach, uh, and Dead Man's Hand, which we were playing earlier on. Uh, for those who were watching the stream earlier on as well, so we added those areas so that they can go into the solo rotation. So rather than the players having one set of daily quests that they have to do every day, we added a lot of variety and a lot of choice, so that the players have, you know, probably there's like I guess there's somewhere close to between seven and eight hours or ten hours of daily possible daily content, which of course is way more than you know most players' average play session. Uh, so that it means that over the course of a week or a month or whatever they play, they don't have to be doing the same thing for their daily rotation. They can choose. You know, well, today they might do the breach, tomorrow they might do Dead Man's Hand, and it kind of makes the leveling process a bit more varied and interesting for them. Yeah, I would encourage you not to talk to my wife about my playing habits then if you're concerned about people playing eight hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, on average, you know, on average. Uh, <laughs> that being said, I, talking about varied, for those of you that may have never played Age of Conan, one of the things you'll notice at the bottom middle of my screen is the fact that I don't just have a, you know, a, a B, C, D, or one, two, three, four bound to hotkeys. You will see is that I've got a lower left attack, an upper left attack, a middle attack, top right and lower right. And if you can see that guy that I was just bludgeoning with my hammer, he actually has little gray half circles or quarter circles, I guess, around him, showing which ways that he's guarding. And I kind of want to attack the exposed area. And I personally always thought that this was a unique feature. And 
you know, just added something interesting to do, you know, as opposed to just tab target and, you know, hit your macro as fast as you can and do some damage. Yeah, it's a bit more, you know, it's a more active combat. Uh, and I guess, you know, uh, some it's kind of, you know, some players really love it and it's what they love about the game. You know, it, it's the fact that they have to concentrate and it's uh, a lot more dynamic and uh, there's, you know, the combos that they, to really get the power out of it, so you've really kind of mastered, the, like you said, the shields and which direction they go and kind of timing your attacks for, you know, the kind of maximum uh, advantage. And it really adds an element uh, to the game that, you know, not many other MMOs have. Uh, you know, I think you're seeing more uh, try to go that way. Uh, with more action-centric uh, combat and more movement being involved, but I think you know we were one of the, it was, Conan was one of the first games that really took that step and tried to be a bit more action-oriented. Yeah, well, I I definitely like it. It keeps you into it, I'm interested, and uh, I like it. I, you know, I've seen people say that it gets cumbersome after a while, but I definitely think that it adds something to it. And to talk about the combos, if you'll notice here. I'll hit one of these active combos down at the bottom, and it'll tell me different directions that I have to attack in order to do that combo, which is, you know, it's superior to just hitting button one, button two. I got Carpal Tunnel playing a game later on, you know. I actually, one of the games I played at the beginning of last year, I really think I was getting Carpal Tunnel just from smashing the same button repeatedly from long macro chains you'd build. Yeah, no, you, you've really got to, uh, you know, come down to the game where which kind of it's, uh, rewards mastery of, its, uh, of the system and uh, finding those attacks and learning uh, when it's best to use them and uh, using the combos on the right opponent at the right time uh, when the shields are kind of exposed uh, to maximum damage for that attack. All right, we're going to take a 30 second break right there. i got to hit the chat room with a commercial so Justin's happy. And by Justin, I mean the .tv people. I'm still trying to get my way to this dungeon, guys. I am. I'm going to get there, and I just realized I walked past it because I followed the uh, trail and got lost killing ghosts <laughs> with my active combat. So it's fun. I also like the fact that I've been walking around this trail finding loot that other people have apparently been killing things and not bothering to pick it up. And uh, I definitely stop and pick up shinies. All right, so we mentioned earlier that Age of Conan is getting ready to enter into its fourth year. So do you have any kind of special things going on to celebrate this milestone? Yeah, there will definitely be, there'll be some exclusive items uh, available in the game uh, that the players will be able to get uh, to kind of designate that they've been around uh, for, the, uh, for the fourth birthday. Uh, the artists and the team are working on those at the moment. Uh, so hopefully we'll have some cool surprises uh, for the players to uh, to claim, so that they can, uh, uh, you know, proudly display their veteran status and uh, the fact that they were they were in round. So it's always good when the game celebrates its, you know, the birthdays. I I totally agree with you. I can't I can't stress enough to anybody that's in a service type environment of how much a rewards program can add to like a value of your product without even, and this goes in beyond gaming, but just to show people that you really do appreciate the longevity that they've been with you. So, Yeah, for sure. You know, we, we have a veterans program in the game, uh, and the players can use the veterans vendors and the main veteran vendors. I always get my tongue twisted around those. Uh, the veteran vendors in the main uh, city hubs uh, where they offer, you know, selection of items uh, that veterans came in. And veterans get veteran points for every month that they are premium uh, members of the game. Um, one thing, it's kind of out of sequence, but I hop back to it. I know that before you guys actually released and the game was still in beta, that there was grumblings that Age of Conan might show up on multiple different platforms, and that, that obviously hasn't happened. What kind of roadblocks did you guys experience in that process, and what did you learn going through that? Uh, I mean, some of it was before my time. Uh, you know, I was game director on Anarchy Online before I worked on uh, Age of Conan. And I took over on Conan kind of post-launch uh, in the, uh, I guess, the September uh, after the game launched in May of 2008. And, yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, developing for a console is definitely very different from PC. And I think the team did underestimate uh, how challenging that was going to be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, both, you, you, you know, we talked earlier about the graphical level. 
level of the game uh, and how strong it is. And I think that was one of the biggest challenges they faced, that uh, getting the game optimized and running on the 360 uh, proved to be too much of a challenge for the engine uh, the way that it was, you know, the way that it is. Uh, there would simply be too many compromises that would have been required to allow the game to work on the uh, on the console. So we didn't even really get down to the kind of nitty gritty details that can sometimes plague you, uh, uh -huh. like patching and you know how do you patch on a console and all that kind of stuff uh, that MMOs haven't really solved yet. Uh, and there are you know we still haven't seen that many MMOs that have released on the consoles. Uh, you know, but I think that's something that will become easier over time, and you know, maybe with the next generation of consoles and even the tail end of this one, you know, you might see more MMOs uh, coming out on the uh, on the console platforms. Uh, so it was really a technical. It was really the technical complexity of the of the game's engine that uh, was the biggest bottleneck for us in trying to get it. And then it became a resource thing. You know, how much time are you willing to spend, and how much of a window is there for a game? Once it wasn't ready at launch, you know, the viability of that in terms of uh, sales kind of goes down immediately over time because the console, you know, you're relying on that uh, interest and that peak of uh, interest in the game uh, to sell the units uh, because it's more expensive to produce units for uh, the console than it is just, you know, a digital download PC game. No, I totally understand. All right, I, I got a little bit of a new play question for you. I've noticed that I'm persistently once I've been in combat I kind of like get stuck in combat is there some kind of hotkey or some kind of function I'm missing to actually get out of combat you can unsheath you can sheath your weapons uh, there if you go to your abilities menu there is a button to sheath uh, your weapons uh, otherwise you might have still have aggro from uh, uh, someone nearby but yeah you can put your uh, weapons away or there's also options in the game's options to automatically uh, sheath your weapon when uh, combat goes in and out. I can't oh, okay. remember the defaults I, there. I found the button. It was there, and that's all I needed to do. It's like a swap or sheath weapons. And uh, I'm actually, apparently I keep running by this dungeon. I'm right in it's the middle actually, of it's, it. It's, yeah, it's just a path, so you just have to walk up the path. It's oh, not okay. an entrance or anything. It'll, and then the, once you walk up the path, the collision detection will just go, do you want to enter the breach? Hmm. If you're in the right spot. No. Oh. I can't actually. <laughs> I mean, I'm just trying to run where I see the red dot. <laughs> that yeah. should be the right spot. You do need to have done the... Uh, you need to be on the right stage of the quest to get there first. You might want to check that you well, actually... That would be my hold up I haven't done any quests I just was like oh dungeon I'll run up there ah, okay yeah the, the breach all the quest all the a lot of the dungeons and the content in, it has a uh, there's a, a quest which you have to be on to be able to get into the dungeon because it also controls the daily timers okay uh, so there is NPC, there are NPCs uh, scattered around the playfield who provide quests to the different uh... and we also have cool mounts it's important to say Oh, I, I, I love the mounts in our game. Which I, is, uh, I'm a fan. I uh, I got the Rhino and I got the Mammoth from pre-ordering back in 2008. And then I was lucky enough to order to show everybody this new content they got. Uh, Funcom hooked me up with the expansion. And from that, I got myself a nice little camel. I was actually going to subtitle this episode, Me and My Camel. <laughs> but I've got to get myself out of the, combat first before I can actually get on the the camel. The, the other one. The camel. Are... Yeah, the camel was actually a long-standing player request because uh, they've been in the game. You know, the models were in the game at the beginning, uh, uh -huh. so people had seen camels in the game, and they were like, "We want to ride camels." And uh, so when we did Savage Coast of Tehran, and we were talking to the team about which of the uh, which is what the next kind of mount that we should add, mm -hmm. uh, there was only one choice. Because the players the have wanted, you know, the players have wanted camels for a long, long time. So uh, we went with the camel and gave them their uh, their wish, and it made a lot of players very happy that we were able to uh, we were able to add the camels as mounts. Uh, 
because it, it had been a long time coming for them. You know, some of the players had played since the launch in 2008, and they, they really wanted their camel. I don't blame them. And I'm trying to... Oh, I'm getting jumped, apparently. I'm trying to get on my camel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just stuck in combat. So, I mean, that's a good thing. I, I'm a fan of uh, fighting and not standing around doing nothing. But... So you were saying that these require daily quests in order to in enter these. Do you know which quest hub around here will... Uh... There should be an end piece. I, the, 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 the stream is a li I'm running a little bit behind on the stream. Yeah. So uh, it's uh, the NPC is a bit south of the, uh, of the area where you uh, would enter the breach. Is it the, the little orange arrow? It's one of the camps. If I remember rightly, you're stretching my uh, my knowledge of which NPCs. There's so many quest NPCs down there. I uh, I totally understand. I'm not trying to play stump Craig, so I apologize. Oh, that's that's easy <laughs> enough. The guys do it every day. Eh, you know. Let's see what we've got going on here. We can also actually just, I believe we're not too far from a, we can go back to the wall. Now that I'm on my camel, I can run there pretty quickly and show everybody what's going on over there. And there are down here, uh, a quest hub area so we can see if that actually is where our quests are at. And then you can see up here in the north there's the Forgotten City, which is another one of the scalable instances we were talking about, level 40 to 80. Yeah. And they all they scale dynamically. And also uh, with some of them we're, we're doing new versions of them in the summer so that maximum level players can also uh, repeat them and use because they're while well, they scale to 40 to 80 the progression in Conan continues post max level so the alternate advancement system kicks in uh, and then so to a fully specced veteran who has a good number of AA points and has their best gear those dungeons kind of become trivial to them even though they can scale to 80 uh, so we'll be making versions especially for the max level players that come out later in the summer uh, and they'll have appropriate rewards so that solo players will be able to gain uh, more of the armor that they want and the tokens uh, from doing those daily uh, uh, those daily quests and going to those areas and get a better reward uh, from a better you know from a uh, a better challenge. Okay, as a returning player, like I said, I mentioned I played at the very beginning. What are a few of the things since I stopped playing in mid 2008 that in 2012 I should know that you're most proud of of your development team and what you guys have been able to accomplish with the game. Yeah, I, the team have done a, a really good job. There's a lot of stuff uh, that's been added. Uh, like I said, two expansions, Rise of the God Slayer, the area you're running around in now, and mm -hmm. uh, the Savage Coast of Tehran, uh, which was added in 2011. We've kind of we we smoothed out all of the uh, I guess the content gaps that people were worried about when the game launched. Uh, so we added a huge one of the first things we did was added a huge new area called Emir's Pass in Sumeria, uh, which is kind of uh, takes its cue from one of Howard's original stories uh, and the story of the Frost Giant. Uh, and that added content, uh, I think that's levels 55 to 63, if I remember, roughly. And uh, we added areas like Tarantia Commons, which kind of fill out the story of Conan's capital city of Tarantia. And that adds kind of urban combat uh, and kind of a really cool urban area to the game. Uh, full of ladders and rooftops and assassins skulking around the, the you know the the tops of the buildings and uh, includes a great dungeon called the Iron Tower. And then on the system side of things, we've added a lot of functionality like the Guild Renown system, so players can now their guilds can level up uh, and they can gain new buildings for their guild cities and you actually even new quests. So the further as they level up in Guild Renown, more people come to their guild city and more NPCs appear. Uh, which kind of adds to the functionality uh, for players. So it, it's really, like I said, you know, the beauty of an MMO is you have uh, constant development. Uh, we've added a, a, a huge amount of content. I mean, that's really the biggest thing is I'm really proud of how the team has adapted to, you know, creating live content and constantly putting it out. I mean, last year alone, I think we added the Adventure Pack, uh, and I think it was... One, two, three, four, five, six new dungeons. Uh, on top of uh, you know, on, and that's on top of a full adventure pack, which was a huge outdoor area uh, and had its own dungeons and its own new raids. Uh, and we've got a new raid instance coming up in the next couple of weeks in the Jade Citadel in Kitai, which is kind of taking the max level raid players and giving them new content. Uh, 
So it, it's really been about constantly adding content and really not trying to give up and on the pace and keep pushing that pace. Okay. Uh, Earlier I had talked to you about traveling to the new zone that I guess is the most recent zone that you added in. Yep. It's kind of like Tortage, only a more advanced version. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned I needed to go to Kimi. Yes, you need to, and then you need to go to the market. So you need to head out across the water again from where okay. you are there. If I'm watching the stream correctly, it's yeah, lagging it, I guess. Yeah, so, it's like a 10-second delay usually. Yeah. Uh, so in Kemi, you need to head to the main, to the island itself. Uh, kind of, you'll have to swim out from where you are in the opposite direction to where you're heading now. Uh, okay, I was actually looking for the boat guy, but I can swim. Uh, speaking of swim, I just okay. wanted to throw this out there. One of the things when I first started playing this game that really struck me and stood out. Obviously. Oh, the boat, guy, the boat guy's by the beach there. He can yeah. take you back across. Was the, the water. Yeah, he wants money, though. <laughs> no one ever wants to do anything for free. Was the, the water effects. Uh, in 2008, this water was the best water I'd seen in any MMO. So just uh, let your art guys know, whoever it was that did it, if they're still around, they did a great job. Yes, uh, they, you know, they, uh, we absolutely, they absolutely did. And, you know, the... Uh, the game looks awesome, even to this day, and that's because the Dreamworld technology platform is continually developed. It's not just kind of laid to rest. It runs uh, Age of Conan. It's going to run the Secret World. Uh, even Anarchy Online is being ported onto it at the moment, and that's developed centrally by our technical team here. Uh, mm. So in Kemi, in Kemi, you need to head into the market. I think if you take a right when you kind of okay. get up past those, uh, it's the main market street, and she's right in the middle of the market street. Oh, Her name is a guard's attacking me. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm dead. <laughs> okay, so... Don't, uh, want to, don't want to accidentally aggro the guard. <laughs> Apparently I did. <laughs> is there like uh, open world PvP in this city, which is why I got level 80 guards killing me or something? Uh, it depends on the server you're on. Uh, the PvP, the guards will react uh, to PvP if it, happens mm -hmm. around, if it happens around them. So yeah, if you accidentally targeted and tried to hit someone, they, uh, the guards will very much get interested. Yeah. And, uh, I, I would try like and stop you. to point out before we uh, transported here that earlier I actually had to take a caravan from Kimi to the city that I was, Katai, the city I was in. And uh, yet the caravan can get attacked along the way. And I was fortunate enough to have that actually happen. And yep. I had two little worms attack me, and I was like, well, this is kind of easy. And then I started walking back to the caravan, and then apparently their mom got upset and decided that she wanted to come kill me too. And then I ran, and then I realized that oh, I can kill this, but uh, it took a while. So, so if you, if you head up the steps uh, to your, uh, uh, <laughs> with the stream being ten seconds behind, it's yeah. so kind of behind behind you where you are now. If you kind of do a three sixty, uh, one eighty, and I'll uh, stop and, let, and catch up. Okay, I'm I'm stopped. Okay, there we go. Uh, where that guy in the tiger just came from, if you kind okay. of walk up, if you walk up the... Uh, Which, by the way, is a cool-looking tiger. Oh, and we got an ad on the stream. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You should get an ad blocker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll watch their ad. It's, uh, I'm sure it's pay helping pay for the stream. You, you don't happen to know her name, do you? Because it looks like everybody... It's Tali. Tali? Yeah, you look like you're heading in the right direction. Yeah, if you head into the uh, into the souk, into the market, just kind of go straight, that, keep going straight down that path. Yeah, there's my tombstone. <laughs> so if you keep walking down this uh, up this path... Uh, you should find yourself into the souk, and she's right in the middle of the souk. So if you go right now, there you go. And again, you know, the, this area just shows the cool lighting effects and the. You know, the kind of, it is very nice. The shadows. Yeah, it, the the engine really adds to the game. Uh, the lighting engine is really fantastic, uh, and the Dreamworld technology guys have done an amazing job. Uh, you know, they push the boundaries of what's possible, and they're kind of trying to make sure that we're always using the technology that's available to the best of our ability.
and I got the new quest. Yeah, and she will give you a quest, and then the caravan guy will now let you travel to Tehran. That's good, because he went earlier. He was like, so this... he was like, tell me about yourself. And he was like, <laughs> no, I'm not going to tell you. And the fact that you want me to talk about me and the stuff like that just means that I'm not going to talk to you at all. You know, I, I can actually wander around Kemi aimlessly sometimes, just looking at the pretty god race and the uh, the lovely lighting effects. Uh, yes, for one of the streamers just asked if the game is free, and it is a free-to-play model. There is obviously premium content that you can purchase, but the basic game itself is currently free, and I believe yep. the client's free to download as well. Yes, that's correct. The game is completely free-to-play, and actually you can level all the way straight up to level 80. Uh, all the outdoor quest content and everything included in the original game is completely free to play. Uh, and the premium content covers the, previ the subsequent expansions and some premium dungeons. Uh, so, but the, in terms of playing the game, there's no content blocks at any rate. So, you know, whether you want to go to level 20, level 40, level 60, or all the way to level 80, uh, you can do that for completely for free. You, you could you could get to max level in this game and not have to pay a penny if you don't want to. I would like to say that the game doesn't feel free to play, and I want to explain that to the audience a little bit more. Is that a lot of the games that are designed initially with the basis of being free to play don't it really seemed to have an overworld that feels like a real world. It, it seems like a bunch of little bitty instances or maybe one giant hub put together and then little kind of modules that branch off of that that feel very isolated and not part of an, you know, one solid seamless world. Whereas this feels like a full game. It doesn't feel like something that was designed free to play. Yeah, no, I, you know, I, I think, you know, we're kind of... Uh, one of the games that kind of converted to the free-to-play model, you know, after it's, and I think it's a great way that older titles can continue to stay relevant uh, and attract people to come and play and see what was, you know, it's it's a big production value game, and we still maintain those production values. The team have got better and more efficient at it over the years. You know, they now know, you know, we know how to make content relatively quickly uh, and get stuff out and keep the same graphical standard uh, that. You know, sh shot in the original game. I think if we get through to uh, the city of Ardashir, which is uh, where the caravan guy will take you, uh, if you head up to the second caravan guy after the one that takes you to Katai, uh, he'll take you to the city of Ardashir, uh, which is the port, the kind of hub for the content in the Savage Coast of Tehran. And uh, I think he's up the hill there. You have to kind of go up and then yeah, have fun. And. Uh, this, I'll, hopefully, it'll, you can load in, and uh, the city itself, the city of Ardashir, is one of the art achievements that I'm most proud of the team for, because uh, Ardashir kind of has a, a Persian theme. So, those of you who know Robert E. Howard's world and the Conan world, is each of the kind of cultures in Howard's world were kind of inspired by real life cultures. Uh, so, Stygia is kind of Egyptian, Aquilonia is kind of Greco-Roman, Sumerian is very Celtic. Uh, and in the Savage Coast of Tehran, we got to go to Tehran, which is Persian. Uh, so you have this, if you kind of pull the camera around and kind of look around you and then look up from this kind of dock, you'll see one of the most impressive city vistas I think you'll, you'll find in an MMO where you see this giant statue that's kind of looming over the city. Uh, and that's all tied to raid instances that uh, players get to see later. So when you look up, and you kind of look towards the horizon on the right-hand side, you kind of see this huge statue that's just kind of like literally pulling himself out of the cliff face. And actually, that's one of the raid instances later in the game uh, so that players can go and raid inside the temple that's kind of hidden behind that statue. Uh, and you can actually run up and run in there and go and look around and poke around the entrance to the, uh, to the temple, and it's really got these kind of really majestic views. We really wanted to give the city of Ardashir this very fantastically Persian influence, and we've got a, a great soundtrack, which actually won awards. Uh, our composer, Knut Haugen, won the uh, Hollywood Music and Movie Awards uh, for one of the tracks for the Savage Coast of Tehran, uh, one of the atmosphere pieces that plays while you're in this playfield. Uh, so it, it's really got this kind of fantastic Persian feel, uh, 
and it's an area that uh, I'm really proud of the art team and uh, the guys put together. And the, the NPC that you're talking to at the moment is uh, a guy called Artis. And anyone who saw the Conan movie that released last fall will actually recognize him in that uh, he was one of the characters in the movie. And our game is set 25 years on. And so the players kind of get to meet up with some of the characters from the movie and see where they're at, uh, you know, in the future. That's definitely something that uh, helps you stand up from the pack. There's not too many MMORPGs out there these days that have movie tie direct movie tie-ins. No, and that's a, that's the beauty of working with uh, you know a big license. Uh, we have the movie and the Dark Horse comics and, and you know books that come out and uh, the Paradox license team are great. We're very we cooperate with them uh, kind of almost on a, a weekly basis. Uh, so they see what we're doing and we talk about the different things that are coming up in the in the with the Conan license team. Uh, and they're great to work with. It's a fantastic brand uh, to get to work with because it it's kind of with its kind of lower fantasy setting, and uh, it's not a generic fantasy setting. It it has a lot of uh, it has a lot of potential for telling different stories than you normally get might get to see in an MMO. Okay, um, I notice here that there's a couple of red dots, which I believe represent dynamic instances on this yeah. island. Is there a place, real quick, that I can grab a quest and jump into one of these instances and start to show these people what some of the action is about? Uh, the quests actually, there's, there's some preamble, there's some quests you have to do first. Okay. Uh, so artists, you actually have to do some quests for artists which send you around the city to kind of get you acclimatized to Ardashir first. Okay. Uh, but if you head to your left and head outside the main gates of the city, uh, you'll actually see some combat because there's uh, some forces are actually assaulting the city when you first arrive. Uh, and one of the first tasks uh, that you get is to kind of figure out what's going on. In uh, Because this play field is actually rather huge. The city of Ardashir is only kind of the, the tip of it. Uh, it's a hub where you can get quests and okay. go, go to the auction house and uh, travel. Uh, but the play field itself is actually huge with canyon areas and a great plain area. If you like zoom out the map, you can kind of see the scale of uh, the coast of Ardashir, the whole play field. And there's a whole bunch of content... Uh, so head out to the south gate. Yeah, and uh, you get to see the kind of scale and scope of the uh, of the playfield because it's uh, again, you know, using that uh, the fantastic technology that the uh, uh, the game allows. It's really got some uh, kind of we kind of push it to, as much as we can to show these great vistas and uh, create lots of open space now where the players can uh, experience content and go on quests and. This kind of, the, the city that you're in now is kind of a quest hub, uh, mm -hmm. and then the player can pick up quests and head out and both solve the mystery of what's happening in Ardashir and also a lot of quests in the, with the different factions that are kind of scattered around outside. Okay, apparently this guy's telling me about conflict. Yeah, and then you can actually see that the... Uh, I have to deliver a message for him. Continue that south. You say that I'll see some conflict. Yeah, there was uh, the guards might have taken care of it, but when the player first comes through the doors, there's dynamic events that respond that sends the the rebels are attacking the uh, the city gates. There's a legless man here, piped. <laughs> That's they one thing about AOC. Do you guys still carry the uh, mature rating since you went unchained, or did you guys back down to like a teen or anything after that? Actually, we went the opposite. Uh, the game, because it's, we're online, uh, mm -hmm. the game is actually, uh, because we no longer have physical distribution and we're digital only, uh, okay. the game is actually unrated. Uh, so it's, we're not actually, the game is actually officially unrated. Uh, yeah, I, I try to keep it PG around here, but I did kind of point <laughs> out to any of the viewers that I was standing in front of my horse uh, and I was highlighting the fact that their name was Whores. <laughs> so, and, uh, it yeah, out. it's definitely, you know, the Conan license is very brutal and sexy and dangerous. And we kind of play to that, uh, with a lot of the content, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's being, it's being true to, uh, you know, the, the Conan mythos and the kind of this dark, brutal world. 
that uh, is very unforgiving. You know, you 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 know that you're in a fight for your life most of the time, and uh, it's not a nice place to be. You know, there is uh, it's all kind of full. Of, the thing I love about the Conan license is it's kind of all shades of gray. There's no kind of uh, black and white. There's no good guys and bad guys. Everyone's got a motive, and everyone's kind of got uh, their reasons for being there, and their reasons for uh, you know for fighting on one side or another. I think that definitely helps out too. With the correct me if I'm wrong here, it's been a while since I've tried any of the PvP that's in the game, but it's more of like a guild versus guild type of deal, which and not necessarily factions, correct? Yes, correct. So a, a world where it's grays and not black and whites would definitely help align itself to that kind of PvP content. Yeah, we don't have it's not kind of Horde Alliance or you know Dark Ages three uh, three factions. It's very much a uh, uh, this kind of world, because Conan, you know, the world that C C Howard's Conan lived in, he was kind of, he, he really hated civilization. You know, he's kind of an honest guy. Conan was kind of the stereotypical archetype guy that, you know, he, he, he wore his heart in his sleeve and he called a bad man a bad man and chopped his head off. And <laughs> he didn't have time for politics or, uh, you know, any of the machinations of uh, sorcerers and anything like that. He just, you know, he lived his life uh, by this kind of very moral code. And, you know, even though he's seen as kind of like an anti-hero, you know, he, he didn't really care for civilization. So that's why he could quite happily live as a thief for many years of his life, you know, because he saw those people as corrupt and not worthy of their possessions in the first place, you know, and he was just kind of doing what he had to do to survive. Uh, kind of like a more of, barbaric Robin Hood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he had, he had this underlying honor to him. You know, the character is fascinating in that way in that he, you know, he does lots of bad, what people would say are bad things. You know, he does murder people, and, you know, he was a thief for many years' life. He was a pirate. Uh, but it's always kind of underpinned with this very honorable intent. You know, he never intends, he's never anything more or less than what he claims to be. Uh, even as king, you know, our game is set 25 years, mm -hmm. you know, and after the first stories, and he's risen to the throne of Aquilonia, and it's kind of a... Uh, somewhat of an uncomfortable sitting for him but he you know he takes it because he you know he kind of sees it as his duty to uh you know he's kind of won this kingdom uh through force of arms and then sees it as important that he's uh he's a good king you know as you can see here i'm kind of swimming around and swimming's never really i would never say swimming's great in any game but it's, it's not too terrible and, one. <laughs> and it actually looks really cool underwater. The auto, yeah. the underwater caustics that the graphics guys put mm -hmm. in uh, last year. These were visual effects that were added over the uh, in the Dreamworld updates last year. Uh, in the areas where you do go underwater, it's actually quite cool when you see the light kind of coming down from above and you get that kind of underwater caustics going on. It's a really you know visually, it's actually quite striking to the point where I think I've drowned a few times because I'm kind of like, oh crap, I'm. Uh, well, I, I, I'm, 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 actually, up yeah, I'm actually looking over my shoulder because I'm worried about sharks after the uh, <laughs> demonstration you put on earlier. I'm afraid that I'm just going to all of a sudden turn into bait for something. So yeah, just, you're you're safe. You're safe in the bay there. But if you do swim too far out to sea, yeah. uh, I was you know that was kind of a cool uh, a cool way that the designers uh, approached you know rather than putting an invisible wall, let's just have sharks eat yeah. people stray too far. The people in Jaws thought they were safe in the bay too, so. <laughs> but I'm just about done with this one. I'm picking up my eight of eight royalties here and trying to, you know, it's not too bad. It's the standard collection yeah. quest. Yeah, a lot of the quests in the first hub, they're kind of they're just designed to get you out and about and kind of uh, show, show off the zone to you. Yeah, kind of get acclimatized to where you're going and what you're doing. Uh, but there's several, you know, there is. I think there's there's at least there's probably over 50 or so quests just in this zone, uh, you know. So there's hours and hours of content, way more than you can cover in a you know a short stream. No, uh, I, and that's and you know that's kind of the the benefit of having a four year old game, is there's more you know for a new player coming in, uh, there is literally hundreds of hours worth of content. Uh, it's not something that you're going to kind of it's just disposable and you'll be done with in a couple of days. You know, this is uh, there is literally hundreds of hours of content across uh, the original game and two expansion sets of content uh, for you to uh, enjoy and explore. All righty, I'm gonna do a commercial there again real quick. Why change quests and nobody really misses out on anything? 
I am going to power through all these quests and get myself into an instance before the end of the night. It will happen. <laughs> so, all the streamers out there, if you hang with me, we will get into that dungeon. I promise you, because I want to see the scalable content that uh, Craig's talked so much about today. I think if you go to your quest journal and look at Artis's quests, that's the line that uh, you need to do to get him to give you the quest to go into Dead Man's. There we go. The Envoy of Artisher. Is that it, or did I, make, did I pick up the wrong one? It should be the main quest that, yeah. The... I guess. And it's gain access to the Artisher Fort, the message yep. to the commander of the garrison. So if you do that quest and give him the quest and hand in those quests and you go through that chain, it sends you back to Artis, and then you're able to go into, uh, into Dead Man's Hand. All right, looks like I have to go actually around the town. Yeah, the Ardashir Fort is actually the, the level 80 team instance that's in there. Mm -hmm. So this just requires you to go into the lobby and speak to the commander. Uh, so if you head to your right, I guess, when you... If, oop, you turned around again, sorry. I'm just following the orange it's, arrow. It's really, yeah, it's really hard giving someone directions when there's a 10-second line. Yeah, <laughs> this way if you start dropping F-bombs, I can cut you off real quick. I'm no, just kidding. And so, yeah, Artist Your Fort is actually the level 80 instance mm -hmm. uh, where team it's a team instance. Uh, but this quest just sends you in to talk to the commander to kind of show you where it is and uh, reveal a bit of the story around Artist Uh But later on, level 80 players will be coming back here regularly to, uh, to take part in the content uh, that actually sees them fight through the forts and uh, take on the general that uh, you'll be learning about through the quests. Uh, in, while you're playing through level 50. So it's kind of that continuity mm -hmm. that while you're playing through the level 50 content in Art of Sheer, you'll be learning all these bits and pieces that then later, when you play the content at level 80, you're kind of, oh, okay, that's that guy. I, I, I've seen them talking about that guy. Yeah, apparently I just name dropped on that guy and it, it scared him, whereas me telling him that I was going to kill him didn't really bother <laughs> him that much. So we're learning. Serving the letter. Alrighty. And then the guy. Is this the general you were talking about right here? General Armand or the. Yeah, so if you if you do his quest, you should. Uh, it should allow you to go back and I and speak to artists and. Uh, and it's kind of, you know, in the stream earlier, we were talking about the consistency of the world. And, you know, some players don't read quest text and don't like reading quest text. Yeah. They just want to get on with it. And, uh, you know, but I, I always think that asking the designers, you know, the designers believe in the content much more and you get much better content out of it when you're creating this believable world and giving them real characters. And I actually find that with experience, you know, and over time that designers actually design better content when the writers are involved and they're really selling the story of what this place is. Uh, and I think so those players that take the time and actually read the quest and come to understand the lore of Ardashir and the area, they really appreciate it because you're kind of like, man, that was actually a really well-told story. I personally am a big fan. I'm a lore, I'm a lore nerd in most of the games that I do play, but for the purpose of trying to get into the instance and show the action, yep. <laughs> reading quest text doesn't really stream very well. <laughs> they get to look at my face as I sit there and stare at my computer and be like, what did that say? And here to question Kozak. And then finish the task. This guy's got a quest. Look, we haven't slept in days. All right, goodbye. No, I think it's a quest room. Apparently, there's undead monsters coming out from the city. <laughs> See, you always, need fallen. Some, always need some undead monsters. I, you know, they're they're a staple in MMOs. Actually, one of the things I mentioned earlier is that I am a, a lore nerd, but I'm also a crafting nut. I, I'm not a big alt person, but what I do is I try to do everything you possibly can on one character to develop it as much yeah. as I can. And I do know that you guys are getting ready to do a, a, a revamp on your crafting system. Is there anything that you'd like yeah. you can or that you'd like to talk about with that? Yeah, there's actually a lot of details. We, we in our last, uh, we do monthly development updates. So we release letters to the community that kind of uh, explain 
you know what's going on and what we're doing, and we are, we revealed a lot of the details uh, in that in last month's letter, uh, so players can go online and look that up. But basically, we're kind of we're, we're kind of going back in time. I'm, I'm a bit of an old school gamer, and we have quite a few designers that think likewise. So we're kind of looking back to a more deeper system where the players can experiment with creating items, and uh, so kind of more reminiscent of say Star Wars Galaxies and the kind of more involved crafting systems that you might have seen in the previous generation of MMOs. Uh, and kind of overhaul it from the top to bottom. So that we have some really nifty systems where the players will be able to uh, the players will be able to customize items and kind of create. There won't be currently in the game everything's a recipe and you know what you're getting when you make it. Uh, whereas with the new uh, system, players will literally be able to experiment with different ingredients and kind of add different stats to different items and try and figure out what the best combinations of the items are to make the best item. Uh, for their class, or for you know, for selling, or you know, whatever uh, purpose it is that they have at that time. So it really kind of, like I said, it harks back to kind of galaxies and maybe a little bit of the old Diablo systems, and uh, you know, that kind of hopefully with a little bit more depth uh, than you see in some of the uh, uh, in some of the you know, kind of current generation of mm -hmm. uh, trade skill systems. We really wanted to add a bit more depth there. Yeah, I actually have thoughts on that, but. I'm not a system engineer, so I'll keep to myself <laughs> and not a spouse upon them on the stream. But I do like crafting, and I like it when people try to, you know, you're not always going to succeed at everything you do, and not even the first time out. But it's good to see that you're actually willing to say, hey, you know, obviously the player base doesn't like what we're doing now. Let's try to address this. You know, you can't obviously change everything everybody asks for, but it's nice to see that you do go back and change some systems. Yeah, for sure. You know, and that, like, you know, it goes back to the the fact we're an MMO. It's four years on. You have a bit more leeway, and you can go back and look at some older systems, uh, and you know, figure out. Yeah, you know, we can change that, or we should change that, or uh, you know, we'll definitely benefit from doing this or that. And you know, trade skills are something I think that the players, you know, all kind of agreed they didn't really, they weren't that compelling. They kind of work. Uh, you put time into them, you get the results, you can get some items. Uh, but they're they're not really they weren't really a compelling system and there wasn't much depth to it. Uh, and what so what we really want to add is that depth. Well, I think I'm getting closer. It looks like I'm about done with that chain. It it did give me yeah. a side quest to kill some undead. Do I need to do that before I go? No, you don't. Okay. You just need to go. I think it's go back to you can go back to head back towards Arctis now. Alrighty. So I mean, the players have, uh, you know, so we, we, the players' feedback was kind of solid all the way through. That you know, the trade skill is it, it's just kind of uninspiring. You know, it didn't really. No one loved it. You know, in some games, you have a system that even if it's kind of, uh, even if it divides opinion, it has its supporters. You know, and the guys are like, no, I love that system for what it is. It, it really. We didn't have any anyone kind of doing that with the with the crafting system we had. And that was kind of where we're kind of like, okay, we don't really have anyone champion, championing it. Uh, you know, people are like, yeah, it's okay, it's functional. It, you know, it's kind of it kills time, and we make stuff. Uh, but what you really want is the players caring. You know, you want them to uh, to want to have that system where they can really sink time into it and find some cool stuff and make some items that uh, progress their characters and uh, in an interesting way. Well, I think. I just opened up the item shop, which, uh, is there anything in the item shop you'd like to touch on real quick since I accidentally apparently hit the hotkey and opened it up? <laughs> uh, I mean, the item store, we've tried. I think, you know, uh, there's a selection. And you should have the quest, I think, that lets you into the island now. By the, way. Uh, the item store, uh, we kind of focus on vanity items and uh, convenience items. So, you know, XP potions and uh, teleports, things that can, you know, speed up and going to make the experience uh, a little bit faster for you if you want to. Uh, but the bulk of the sales and uh, you know where we is the is the vanity items mm -hmm. where uh, the, where the players uh, can uh, create new armor and we added the vanity system into the game in uh, with uh, free to play. So now players can wear any armor they like in their vanity panel and that kind of overwrites what's in their uh, power armor. So if they want to, you know, if they want to look like a bare-chested barbarian and look like Conan while wearing full plate armor in reality, they can do that. That's, you know, 
uh, they're able to do that. And uh, it's a great system. I love that kind of thing. Uh, and, uh, it's good because it's what people wanted. People want, and it's always nice it's, to, it's actually, to provide that. Yeah, it's the maps on the boat that you're. That you oh, there we on. go. So if you go back onto the boat, uh, there we the go. map will oh, allow you. Tell me, not yet. Oh. Dead man's hand. Yeah. Yeah, not yet. Okay. You must have one of the other quests still to do. Yeah, that's how you get to it uh, when you've done the prerequisite quests. It's uh, and the other one's level eighty, so you won't be able to. Do yeah, that probably yet. not. That's uh, that requires a maximum level character, and that's uh, the other instance that comes off that boat uh, is the Island of Iron statues, and it's actually really cool because it's a it's a fairly literal retelling of one of Howard's original stories, and trying to convert a short story into an MMO gameplay experience was actually a really interesting challenge. Uh, it, it's really it's really good fun. It's a fantastically uh, well realized instance uh, where you literally. Conan had an adventure on that island himself mm -hmm. when he was younger, many years before, uh, and you actually revisit that, and the kind of the story kind of uh, echoes Conan's. So you kind of go through the same kind of experience that he had, uh, meeting some of the same kind of foes, and it, it, it's really cool because it's kind of uh, you know a literary adaptation in an MMO isn't something you see all that often, uh, and so challenging a designer to okay make this story work in an MMO. Uh, it's it kind of it was kind of a cool challenge for the guys, where they had to, uh, you know, try and figure out how they could use the same elements, and it where it comes together really well, and it it works fantastically uh, well, and it's kind of a, a timed experience where the player has to uh, try and get through this jungle with uh, some ancient foes kind of chasing. It, it's a uh, it was a really cool experience and great for the guys to do. That's uh, and like I said, you know, the license it goes back to the license and. How the wealth of uh, the wealth of material that we have to kind of base content on is uh, is quite cool. It, it would appear that Artis gave me a quest actually to speak to a drunken pirate. Does that sound like something in the chain that I have to complete first before we can go to that quite island? Possibly. Yeah. Anything okay. Artis or anything Artis has given you that would explain it. Then you know. Looking at the time, it seems I've kept you for almost an hour, and I know you're you're busy. So uh, if uh, if you want to take off now, I totally understand, and I really appreciate all the time you spent sitting here talking with us. And I not a problem. Have a. Uh, I generally don't need much encouragement to talk about MMOs. You know, we you're, we're you're lucky welcome to stay as long as you want. I'm just trying to give you a <laughs> give let's, you the flag that you can run for the hills. Let, let's see if we can get you to the island. That that would be that'd be great. So I'm trying to run away from these packs. So I tried to take one on solo earlier, and they kept getting ads, and it wasn't working out so well for me. Yeah. So it, I mean, it, it's kind of uh, the the area has a lot of content uh, and a lot of outdoor content as well. You know, there's actually whole quest lines that take place outside the city. Uh, and in these different areas, uh, I have to admit I, I, it's been a while since I played through at level fifty. I kind of came through here in my level eighty character, and uh, it's like, oh, I want to play the instances. When I when it got to my play characters, you know, you test it yeah. so much, you go through the testing while you're before you're launching, and uh, you know, then you're kind of like, okay, I, 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 when it's on live, it's like I, I want to play with my uh, with my live character, and my live character's level eighty, so uh, it's. Uh, I totally understand. Like I said, I'm a big, I make a character as, as strong as I possibly can and do everything with that guy. And if it's lower level content than me, I usually don't see it again. These ladies, they don't fight like girls. <laughs> no, the, the the women in Conan rarely do. You know, we, we're all for, uh, you know, for strong... Uh, some of the fiercest enemies you'll fight will be female in uh, in the game. You know, Conan didn't discriminate. Uh, you were just as likely to be, uh, you know, uh, to find a fierce uh, female warrior as you were a male one. I I also like to say that I like the rest button because I don't like having to use consumables to 
you know, heal myself up when I'm out of combat and it just takes so long. I'd rather yeah. just hit rest and not waste my time. And there are, I mean, most people when they're playing, the, you know, the game is kind of balanced against having the consumable, you know, the potions running. Uh, because potions in Age of Conan aren't a one-shot, you know, heal you for a thousand health. They're mostly heals over time. Uh, so they kind of tick along. So if you're struggling with any of the content, uh, the best advice there is to pick up some of the potions and have them running while you're in combat, because a lot of the encounters are kind of balanced for at least having the basic potion running, uh, so that you've got that baseline of having uh, that kind of basic hot on you uh, during uh, during combat. And the veterans will be laughing at me, going, "Ah, I don't need that. No, I, I can do the content, whatever." You know, but uh, I think you know a lot of vet- veteran players often forget what it was like to be playing the game for the first time round. Yeah. So, so what you're saying is the buffs that what's this? I've chanced upon a disoriented man lying on the shore. Let's see what he has to offer. Maybe he'll help fight with me because Lord knows I could use a hand. From this marauder, as she pummels me. So, how long ago did you guys add in the uh, alternate advancement system? The alternate advancement system came in with uh, Rise of the Godslayer with the mm-hmm. Kitai expansion. So uh, that allows for post AD progression. Uh, so players earn uh, alternate advancement points as they play through the content after level 80. Uh, and then they can spend those points in their alternate advancement trees. And the alternate advancement kind of works a little bit like a clone between a traditional AA system like you might have seen in the original EverQuest or EG2, uh, but also kind of Guild War style where you can't have all of them equipped at the same time. Uh, Level 80 players open up their alternate advancement bar, and in that bar they can place one or two abilities from each tree. Uh, in the alternate advancement, so they can't, even if they have all the alternate advancement, they have to choose situationally which of the alternate advancement abilities they want to be using at any given time. And I just brought up right now what would be my alternate advancement mastery expertise or prowess. And it says i got to be level 80, so I can't do anything with it. Yeah. But that's what it looks like. Yeah, and it's basically, and with the alternate advancement system, you can either spend the points directly that you earn through gaining XP, or there's actually an overtime component as well. So you can just activate one to be learning, kind of like an Eve Online, uh, and that runs in real time. It's funny you should mention Eve Online. I just introduced myself to that one last week, and I <laughs> that that Eve gives a whole new meaning to the word daily quest. <laughs> with that skill training system. I mean, I really, yeah. I, I enjoyed it very much. Um, I just thought it was a new twist. I wish this guy would, like, help. He's just kind of standing there. <laughs> He's like, you can do it, man. You can do it. Bit of a cheerleader. Hey, somebody needs to get this guy some pom-poms. Do they sell those in your vanity shop? I can buy from them real quick. <laughs> I haven't got the cheerleader uniform there. I'm not sure that would quite fit with the lore. Oh, that's a different game that just came out this year <laughs> that you can get a cheerleader outfit in. I guess it was last year. So what's um what's on tap for the future? For I don't think we've really talked about what you guys have coming out later on this year. Yep. So immediately uh, in the next couple of weeks, we have a new raid instance uh, in the Jade Citadel. Uh, so it's the continuation of Tier Four raids for the maximum level players, uh, and there's some really cool gameplay in there for the raid players. Uh, probably the most complex raids we've ever put together uh, and in a really fantastic location. So that's coming out soon. And then in the summer, we have uh, new versions, level 80 versions of those dungeons that we talked a little bit about earlier. Uh, we have the trade skill revamp. Uh, we have a lot of system changes. We kind of fo- we focused a bit earlier this, you know, the, through the early part of this year to kind of do some more system-centric stuff because when you're constantly adding content, you're kind of challenged to always be be working on the content, and uh, sometimes you need to just take a step back and look at the system stuff and kind of the quality of life updates that uh, the players might want uh, for PvP. Or so we're adding in things like dual spec, so the players can switch easily between uh, uh, specifications and their feat builds. Uh, so if they want to switch between PvP or P- and PvE play, they can do that a little bit easier. As well as looking at some of the more PvP centric systems like the stealth system and uh, the way that stamina is used 
in uh, in the game uh, because that has a real bearing on how PvP plays out. Uh, so we're amending that a little as well. Uh, and then, of course, towards the end of the year, we have a new adventure pack coming out. Cool. You. One of the things that I forgot about, and commercials going, I'll bring it back up. <laughs> the pets. I need to ask you about the pets. I noticed today the pet sand demon. Yeah. Yeah, I, I could have been having him out this entire time. He would have probably helped out a little bit. <laughs> Cause they can help a little. I mean, the combat pets aren't designed to be major game changers. Yeah. Uh, they're just kind of like little, uh, you know, little assists. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't make a they don't make a fundamental difference to the experience, but they just kind of make it a little bit easier for you. Oh no, I, I mean I, I get it. You never want to see cash shops start offering items that you know are pay to win kind of things. You you no, want more right. vanity and yeah, you know, you we your comforts, not you know, game changing system mechanics. Yeah, exactly. You know, we have a threshold for, uh, you know, even the power items that the store does have, uh, and there are armors that you can get that have stats, but they're never the best that are available. Uh, we've been very conscious, and we've said all along, you know, the, the best gear in the game, the stuff you really want, will never be in the cash, in the cash store. Mm -hmm. You know, there'll be convenient stuff there that makes your life a little easier on occasion. Uh, you know, or if you want a little leg up, so you know you get to level 80 for the first time, and you kind of you feel a bit underpowered. There is a set of armor there for you at level 80, but it's nowhere near the best stuff in the game, or even the good, good the good stuff in the game. It's kind of a a stopgap to kind of to bridge that gap to allow you, if you want to, uh, to kind of get ready for actually, you know, the harder content, uh, kind of as a bridge if you uh, if you feel that uh, you kind of want to. Uh, take a shortcut. Yeah, no, potions, different things like that, I totally see those. And apparently, well, I, I helped that guy. His quest is complete, and now he's gone. <laughs> he's like, thanks, have fun. I'm going to leave while you're fighting that person. <laughs> My job here is done, people. <laughs> he helped me, and now I'll abandon him. So one of the things that we talked about, I think it might have commercial might have interrupted, is if you notice, I realized that there are combat pets now, and this is my sand demon. Yeah, and he's cool. He was at, he's actually straight out of the movie. So the sand demon plays a big role in one of the action scenes in the movie. Uh, Rose McGowan's character, the uh, the witch Marik, she summons them to fight Conan. Uh, so players who've seen the movie will actually have seen these guys in action fighting against Conan. Uh, in the film, so we thought it was kind of a cool homage to that that uh, we were able to include them as uh, as pets for uh, for the players. I like to call him Bob. And he's got some neat little. I don't know what exactly those are called. Nifty little weapon with them. Yeah, again, and those were modeled directly from the movie. So we had great cooperation from Lionsgate while they were making the film, uh, and they were really fantastic about giving us kind of early previs material so mm -hmm. we could see things that were being done in the movie even before they were public uh, so that our artists could start to model and make sure that everything was consistent and kind of looked just like it did in the movie. And that's actually some of the best vanity armors that we have uh, in the store. It's a perfect example. You know, we, we've tailored some of the vanity items that are available in the cash shop. They were taken directly from the movie's uh, production. So, you know, they look exactly like they, you know, you can, get, you can get Conan's armor from the movie and make yourself look exactly like Conan did uh, in that film. And, and I think that's something a lot of people would probably, would probably want to do. You know, why be a yep. barbarian? He's wearing what, yep. heavy plate armor, and you can't <laughs> have a blank cloth. There's some of the best-selling items in the store are definitely the vanity pieces. Uh, the players really like uh, to kind of customize their appearance, and they've really taken to the vanity system. It's uh, it's a constant stream of you know, and even the demand for you know, add, constantly asking us add, add more stuff, make sure there's more stuff coming for the uh, for the store, so that they can uh, they can continue to see. I think you might you might be uh, good to go back to artists now, maybe. Yeah, I, I 
I freed his little sailors and I captured his wine. So I'm swimming across the bay now, and you should and, be safe. Sharks. Yeah, I'm. I'm hoping there's no sharks nearby because I. I don't want to be the new chicken of the sea. And I do mean chicken because I'm swimming through the water because I don't want to fight all those other people. Yeah, we're heading towards the stairs. Yeah, so so we've got a good, you know, I'm really I'm really looking forward to the rest of the year. It's kind mm-hmm. of uh, it never gets old. I have a great, there's a great team here in Montreal as well that are working on the game, and uh, you know it, that constantly changes and evolves as well. You know, I talked a lot to our community last year about how great it was to have new people on the team, and uh, you know because we hired a bunch of new young designers when we moved to Montreal. Because uh, we kind of moved half the team from Oslo, and then we had half the team to fill, so we kind of hired locally and brought new uh, enthusiastic young guys and girls onto the team, and they've done a fantastic job. So uh, it's great. It's one of the best teams that I've worked with, and uh, they do a fantastic job on the game, and uh, it, it's great to have that kind of level of dedication to a, to a four-year-old game. Yeah, I was kind of curious about that when I first noticed that you're actually in Montreal, because I thought that Funcom was up in uh, Norway. Yes, that's correct. We're a Norwegian company, and we're based in Oslo, but uh, in 2010, I guess, we decided to open a studio in Montreal, uh, and we are, I think, 215 people here in Montreal now, Mm -hmm. uh, across all the projects that we have, and uh, it's a great environment. You know, Montreal is kind of a gaming hub. Uh, There's uh, eight major studios here, and dozens of smaller ones. I know Ubisoft is up there, too, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Ubisoft, IDOS, Square, uh, Warner Brothers, uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting someone, uh, EA have offices here. So, yeah, it's a uh, it's a very vibrant development community. Yeah, didn't uh, IDOS help work on Age of Conan originally, or were they part of the publishing team? They were the publishers, yeah. So that worked. Cause it was entirely made at Funcom, but uh, they, they were our publishers. I know this because I actually have a boxed copy, which you notice he did say that they're digital distribution only now. So yeah. this is a limited collector's edition, and it does say Eidos on the back yeah. of it. So that's why I knew. And then Paradox is a license holder, and Funcom, the developer, yeah. and NVIDIA is on the back of there, too. The Mayo Swifty played. So I finally got into an instance, though. And this is actually Dead Man's Hand, where uh, we uh, we had a, the stream from earlier. So you should have a good primer for, oh. uh, for what you're about to experience if you were watching the stream earlier. And I was, and I greatly appreciate all your help and your time sitting down and talking to us. No uh, problems at all. It's a pleasure. And uh, I will leave you to play through Dead Man's Hand a little. And uh, ask you know the, anyone who's watching the stream as well, you can, uh, I think, uh, the guys at MMORPG also have the stream from earlier up on the site. So after you're done here, if you want to see some more of Dead Man's Hand and hear from the writer and designer who are responsible for it, that stream is uh, archived up on the site as well. They do, and um, if you'd ever like to come back and do something like this for Anarchy Online, I'd be more than happy to uh, have you. Yep, we can definitely have the guys. Uh, I will. I will speak to the uh, to the dev team down there. There's a great little team on AO, and I'm sure they'd love the opportunity to uh, to talk you around Rubicar a bit. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks, Craig, and uh, I hope you have a great evening. And thanks for being part of the show tonight. Sure, no problem. Sure. Thanks a lot, Rob. You're welcome. All right, guys, that was Craig Morrison. We'll go ahead and let him get out of here since uh, he saw this part. And this is actually on the live stream uh, earlier today they did. Uh, it was about an hour long. They answered questions. They had some guys from the lore team. And if, for anybody that ever played this before, this area is a lot like Tortage, which is a starting city. And one of the things that we really didn't talk about too much is that Tortage was one of the best, if not the best, starting experiences that I had in a game. Uh, So it's really nice to see that they brought something like that back. And that sentiment is shared by a lot of people. And as you notice, this this is a scalable instance that has like a quest hub in it that you can do on a daily basis. So, you know, that's pretty interesting. And we'll just go around here and Kill some stuff. If anybody's got any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Or if there's something you want to see, I'll make sure that we go and try and do it. It's got about at least another hour to go ahead and monkey around in here. <laughs>